we're back. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, cats, and dogs, um, for another session of Real Talk. It is one of the last ones for this season. Um, and of course, who better to have here than one of the most inspirational, powerful goddesses of women that I can potentially ever dream to have on here, but the indomitable Laila Hare, all the way from Aotearoa, aka New Zealand, for those who don't speak Māori. Um, how are you, Laila? I'm very well, thank you, Emma. It's lovely to see you looking so cheerful and bright. Thanks. You know, I think solitary confinement is like, you know, doing me something good. I don't yeah. know. I'm learning to love myself. It's been, it's been a very wild 18 weeks in yeah, quarantine. It's, it's quite, quite hard for us to imagine the scale of it really because as you know here in Aotearoa we now have no community transmission of COVID-19. Um, we get awesome. you know one, two, sometimes three cases in a day in our quarantine facilities with people arriving mm -hmm. back to New Zealand. Um, but yeah, the, the scale of the issue there is just unimaginable and yeah but uh, it's bizarre it's bizarre you know yeah. like having having I, I don't even like saying his name he who must not be named uh in office Voldemort. at the moment and then Voldemort that's okay I was gonna go with that thank you I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know having him in office and then you know having such different representation of, of states you know each governor has had a very different response and it's just it's just been crazy it's been mm -hmm. crazy i'm really lucky to be in dc which is a predominantly um democratic city and people are pretty epic here but um it's just you know it's so easy to drive over state lines and so yeah. when when you know somebody from florida comes into DC then we're screwed <laughs> you know so yeah, I'm so yeah. I'm so thrilled that you guys have have uh have managed to you know stomp it out if you as you you know as you do um although I've seen quite a bit of um animosity towards Kiwis who are coming home have you had much um I not not really I mean the the there have been a couple of breakouts from the mm -hmm quarantine facilities and they're toughening up security there and there's been some nasty sort of um taking down you know on social media and things of people who've who've absconded um right. but no overall I think the whole kind of culture around it has been one of empathy of kindness like we have this new national mission be kind and, I love it. And yeah, I I don't think there's much nasty kind of stuff towards those people at all. And we had an absolutely wonderful um, young woman in quarantine for two weeks who was posting these awesome daily messages on her Facebook page about how incredibly well it went in isolation and sort of you know the 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 heart of the staff who are working in those hotels, the um, the daily different cake slices, oh wow, um, <laughs> the care. So no, I think it's been pretty good actually. I mean, of course, on Twitter and other forums, you know, the haters going to hate, but we're used to that. <laughs> I love um, like one of the things that I think. America you know could learn from but also like they look at me as as kind of crazy but you know we're seeing it so much in 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 New Zealand that it's not just an Emma G thing it's a whole country thing to lead mm -hmm. with kindness to lead with compassion to lead with love there's so many differences and you've traveled a lot during your career what what do you feel are the, like the things that New Zealand really leads the way in when it comes to just being a country, being like the culture that we have? Um, I think we have, um, we still really thrive on the legacy of our social progress as a country. <laughs> um, you know, the usual first in the world where women won the right to vote, um, yes. the sort of 1935 to 38 Labour government 
1941 Labor government that introduced the social welfare system, um, a free national public health system, um, a really good public education system, although that's been sort of whistled away at um, in the last few decades, particularly mm -hmm. at the tertiary level where people now mm -hmm. have to pay fees and take out loans, which was unheard of, you know, when I was growing up. Um, so I think we still have this sort of legacy of social solidarity. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's also um, been a kind of invisibility to the discrimination and the particularly the impacts of colonization on Māori people, um, on their you know, land base, their economic base, their cultural uh, base. And so, you know, at the same time as we have this um, identity as a, a kind of naturally socialist country, mm -hmm. um, we also have a lot of critique and like real talk to quote the program um, <laughs> about you know what that how that plays out in yeah. the lives of many many people. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's so much that I want to talk to you about because you know obviously for those who don't know you or know me who are watching this who know you, you've known me since I was like seven years um, old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think how old you would have been. It would have been. You know, around about 1989, 1990. Oh, really? So, so I was I met, like two when you met me? Yeah, like you were a really little girl when, because your mum was in the new Labour Party with yeah. us. And we started that in 1989. Um, my first child was born in 1990. And you were one of the little, the little New Labour <laughs> Alliance kids that was zooming around. Well, now I just feel kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've probably I've probably known you for longer than most people who you've interviewed on this. This that's chat. hilarious. That's yeah. really funny, and and it's great because like you know, having grown up around powerful women like yourself, um, who've led the way for so many other women in Aotearoa, um, has been a really inspiring. You know, it's it's kind of almost been like you can do anything MG, like move to America, do do whatever you want to do, represent New Zealand, why not? Um how how has that like your political journey from the Alliance Party to the Internet Party to now doing um trade union work and and doing all kinds of international work, how has that journey been for you as a woman from a smallish country? Um well I feel like I've had incredible you know, opportunities in my life to um, to be involved in policy making and social change that's reflective of the, you know, the values around social justice that, you know, people ask where do they come from, who knows, but they've mm -hmm. always been part of my DNA. Um, and I kind of came of age, I feel politically, when I was in my teens at high school, um, this was a time when um, there was sort of mass, there were mass social movements in New Zealand around, um, in particular, anti-apartheid and anti-racism movements, mm -hmm. um, which I became involved in as a teenager. The fight to make New Zealand nuclear free mm -hmm. um, and for a nuclear free Pacific. And there was this extraordinary sort of energy in community action around those issues. So although I ended up being more, more involved over time in party politics, there was always a really strong connection between, you know, the, the political parliamentary politics and the kind of push that was coming from broad social movements. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, for me, becoming involved in that formal political party stuff happened quite naturally because, you know, this was a time when um, not only mass movements and social movements were quite strong and powerful, but also political parties were much more broad, um, much more representative of the community than they are now. I mean, I, I joined the Labour Party in 1982 or something when I was 16. Right. 
Um, wow. And at that okay. time, there were over 100,000 members, which by New Zealand terms is a big political party. I'm a member of the Labour Party again now, and there's probably less than 10,000 members. And this is the party wow. of government. So, right. um, you know, the, the, the engagement with parliamentary politics is much smaller now. Um, and while there are still thriving social movements and there is still a level of activism, the kind of activism in social movements is much smaller too. So I've never bought this thing that you either do one or the other. You're either on the streets or you're in the institutions. I think you can be in the institutions and on the streets and that it's really important for the voices from the streets to be heard in the institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you think there's been such a, a dramatic drop in uh, political involvement? Uh, I, I, think, I think a lot yeah. of it, like for, for a lot of my generation at least, like there were so swamped and, you know, we, we see mm -hmm. this all the time with American politics, so swamped with social media and misinformation. And, you know, there was a whole bunch of, when, when the internet party was, you know, if that was 2000. 15 election, 14 election, um, right, that's when I decided I was moving to the States, FYI, <laughs> <laughs> after that election, I'm like, no. Nope. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that was kind of my year from hell, really, it took me a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'm sure, to... I'm sure, yeah. and, you know, you would have seen firsthand, obviously, you, you know, throughout your career, about the misinformation that gets, you know, thrown down people's throats, but um, do you think that has anything to do with people's lack of motivation to get involved in politics these days? Uh, well, I think there's been a sort of global phenomenon, um, but in, at the local level in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, the sort of 80s and 90s really shattered people's confidence in the political process. I mean, we had a Labour, so-called Labour government elected in 1984, which, mm -hmm. um, and you know, that was the first election that I voted in and I was really involved in the campaign, very active in the party at that time. Um, but what, you know, what happened was the party was taken over um, by neoliberal um, advocates mm -hmm. uh, and New Zealand launched on one of the most um, extreme neoliberal pa policy pathways of any, any nation. I mean, um, we completely removed all um, barriers, trade barriers, unilaterally, which meant, oh, you wow. know, our, our market was flooded um, by cheaply produced um, products from offshore. We lost, you know, m there was massive unemployment as a result of that. Whole towns were effectively closed. Um, and we had the beginnings of a real sort of what's become intergenerational poverty and intergenerational unemployment, particularly in um, provincial cities and towns. Um, we had, you know, some kind of nasty whittling away of our public health system, our public education system. This all sort of started in the the mid 80s and because it was led by a party that was the party that had been created to protect workers and protect communities and make social change um, there was a massive disillusionment with the yeah. political establishment um, and that only became worse with the election of the conservative national party into government um, mm -hmm. in 1990 so um, a lot of our kind of core democratic institutions were really attacked over those years and political parties were one of them. I mean, people dropped out of political parties, political parties split, um, the Labour Party being the first. And, you know, that's when I became involved with New Labour with your mum and yeah. actually the Alliance, which we formed as a coalition of smaller parties. Um, the the trade unions, which had been a really important sort of democratic institution, were gutted. Um, trade union membership was literally decimated. It went down, you know, um, more than half or, you know, to, to kind of levels that are still very low. 
um, union membership levels because of the attacks on the kind of legal status of unions and the, and the legal mm -hmm. right to organize. Um, students associations were made voluntary, whereas previously membership had been compulsory and that had been a real kind of vanguard movement for the development of young leadership and um, people learning their um, leadership skills in the university environment. Um, the whole kind of need for people to work and, you know, have two incomes at work and the massive growth in women's employment, which has a positive side, but also it was like people went, hmm, where have all the women gone that used to run the sports clubs and help out at, you know, the school galas and do all that stuff and look after their kids after school? You know, what, what happened to all that free labour from women? And so, you know, this massive social disruption of these right. poor kind of community institutions that fed, you know, um, the political process ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, people, if people don't have time to, you know, have a beer together at the sports club or um, bake cakes together for the school fair, you know, where where is the the conversation, the daily life, the kind of normal stuff which um, starts to kind of go upwards into the political process and feeds the political process with volunteers and ad activists and eventually members of parliament. So, you know, our parliament and our political parties have become very professional organisations. Um, most of our senior politicians now have come through a very kind of beltway, as you might call it in DC, um, route <laughs> to, to yeah. parliament. They've worked for um, for members of parliament or they've been policy advisors. Um, very few kind of key people in our political system now have, have come from um, a more real kind of normal mm. um, daily life uh, where politics is a consequence of your experience rather than the reason why you do what you do. Right, right. How do you, so like through your entire journey, cause you've, you've seen some shit, um, you know, you've, you've been, you've been through some shit, you've done some <laughs> shit. Um, how have you managed to stay so invested and inspired and motivated to maintain forward progress? Well, I can't say I have, you know, okay. sustain that I'll continuously <laughs> over that time. Um, I, kind of hanker after the feeling that I had as a young person where a younger person where I um, <laughs> you know, I just had this absolute need to be doing stuff all the time that would advance social justice mm -hmm. um, and when I look back to my 20s which you know, was sort of one of the most, well, 20s and 30s, but particularly my 20s, you know, I had, I, I gave birth to two children. I worked full-time as a lawyer. I worked another full-time job for nothing, building a new political movement and campaigning for parliament. Um, and I think where, you know, where did that drive come from? Where, where what happened to all that energy um, that, you know, that was available to me at that time. And, um, you know, that that feeling of absolute necessity to do something and make a difference and change the world um, really drove me through those, you know, probably 15 years of my 20s mm. and early 30s. Um, what devastated me was uh, in... 2002, um, the Alliance Party, which I was a member of, and I was a member of Parliament representing the Alliance, um, we had a, a split. And that split resulted from the US 
decision to respond to the 9-11 attacks by invading Afghanistan and the government of which we were a part, a coalition government at the time with Labour, um, having a debate about whether to join the US invasion and our party, which was as an internet was an internationalist party, a party of peace, um, mm -hmm. of nonviolent kind of solutions to conflict, um, split over whether or not to support the government sending troops. And um, although I was in the majority in the party um, in opposing New Zealand participating. Um, I was in the minority in the party caucus, you know, the members of parliament. Right. And our party split over this. Um, the Labour Party, which were our coalition partner, and they were, you know, significantly bigger than us, um, decided to call a snap election, which we can have in New Zealand, so we don't have fixed election dates. Uh, so the Prime Minister at the time said we're going to have an election in six weeks. And, um, and that kind of ended the alliance as a political party, because here we were in a complete mess, split over a fundamental issue, um, and New Zealanders <laughs> kind of lost confidence in, in our ability to, to represent them, which is probably fair enough. Um, right. So I, that broke my heart, really, because... You know, I had been involved in building this organisation from scratch. It was absolutely my natural political home. We'd had a lot of success and eventually become part of the government. We delivered some great um, policies that have made a real difference to people's lives here. And we had fought the new right, like, without fail, day after day, week after week, year after year, election after election, and we've won mm -hmm. a lot of that. Um, and so, you know, since then, I've never felt I had a real clear political home. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that, that it, is, it is much more difficult to sustain your engagement in politics without a real sense of belonging to a tribe or a team. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've worked with other political parties since then, and now I'm actually back in the Labour Party, but only very much as a volunteer, a helper, because they're closest to my sort of beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, I wouldn't say I found a home yet. Okay. And I'm not really looking Yet. for one. I'm no. Okay. I'm, actually, <laughs> I'm quite quite happy to be. I feel like I'm sort of a homeless person, but in a shelter. And right. the shelter's okay. And you can right. do some good stuff in the shelter. It's not as good as having a home of your own, right. but it does. It's it's interesting. Like so. I'm just imagining now Jacinda being like the, the boss of a shelter. Okay. <laughs> yeah, she is. She's kind of like the Salvation Army, you know, Colonel Jacinda. <laughs> and um, she's got compassion and heart and she gives me soup for lunch and looks after me and my kind of, I feel good about that. But yeah, it's not mine. Right. No, I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. So you you talked about. Um, I mean, obviously, the last seven months of 2020 have been a little bit ridiculous uh, for the world, um, and specifically in the last couple of you know weeks, months here in the US, uh, with regards to the BLM movement having a, a an uprising yet again. It's never gone away, but you know the the, the murder of George Floyd has um, been a thing. You have, you mentioned earlier that you have an experience, uh, you know, working to help the social justice movement with apartheid. Now there seems to be like an uprising of social justice regarding Black Lives Matter in New Zealand. Has that been something that you've been involved with? What, what are your thoughts on, on how that's showing up in Aotearoa? So, um, interestingly, the sort of eruption in the US of Black, or re-eruption of Black 
Lives Matter matters after um, the the recent not just one death but yeah. several um, really resonated in New Zealand um, and it was interesting the timing because uh, we had a five week full lockdown in mm -hmm. April May um, mm -hmm. which meant that we were all confined to our homes and our bubbles as we called them so you could only have social contact with the people in your bubble which was basically mm -hmm. the people you lived with mm -hmm. um, and then you know once there was it was clear that there was no community transmission we slowly moved down a couple of levels and towards the end of level three which still had a rule that although we could, you know, eat in restaurants and things with social distancing and small groups and single servers and all that kind of stuff, um, we couldn't have mass gatherings of more than 50 or 100 people. I can't remember what it was at this point. Um, okay. and, and in mass gatherings, there had to be like one and a half metres distance and all of that. And... But it was sort of becoming clear that there really wasn't community transmission and the steam was running out of the lockdown. And then a protest was called um, in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And um, I don't know the numbers, but there were thousands, which is a big gathering in New Zealand on a political issue, who um, rallied together um, in that first rally, I chose not to join it because I figured, you know, we had um, kind of sustained our solidarity as a community with the lockdown and we were in a fight against the virus and I felt um, like the good citizen thing to do was to keep um, social distance until the government, which there is a lot of support for and a lot of trust in, said it's okay together. Mm -hmm. um, and, but um, like my son and all his mates went and it was massive and it was young and it was had the kind of energy that I experienced in my first sort of engagement with social movements. So it was really real, really spontaneous and very strong. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think part of that was driven by the fact that at the time, I don't, I mean, you're, you're, you, you, you'll know, but a lot of people won't, that New Zealand's police aren't armed. Yeah. Um, and at the time there was, a, there'd been a pilot of arming um, police in South Auckland, which is a part of Auckland which is poorer than other mm -hmm. parts in general, um, has a high um, population of Māori and Pacific Island people than most other parts of Auckland, um, and you know a, a level of kind of the kinds of crimes associated with poverty, um, mm -hmm. and so there was a there had been a pilot of routinely arming police mm -hmm. um, and that became the focus of the kind of policy demand here was to end that proposal, mm -hmm. which happened. So, um, so as a result of your activism in the US over Black Lives Matter, we have retained our unarmed police force. That's um, amazing. Which has been really really positive that's amazing i'm, I'm yeah. so like i i'd heard about the uh the 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 proposal of of arming police which kind of hurt my soul a little bit so yeah. i i was thrilled to hear that <laughs> that yeah, it fell yeah. through that's that's awesome so you also mentioned so you're now working um as a trade unionist and i've tried saying that sentence like several times today without slipping up trade unionist and i realize that's also slightly <laughs> ironic given my last name but <laughs> um can you tell me a little bit about about that because you know unions have been a thing in in new zealand for a long time but there has been you know wavering 
sort of concerns over unionism, um, whether it's a positive thing, whether it's a negative thing, who does it hurt, who does it serve? Um, how did you get into being a trade unionist? Um, I got involved in the trade union movement because I was involved in the Labour Party back as a mm -hmm. um, student. Mm -hmm. And um, when I graduated, which at that time was as a lawyer with a law degree, I went to work for trade unions doing employment law, industrial relations law. Um, and that was my life before Parliament really was advocating for workers, for unions who were taking industrial action, strike action, that sort of stuff. Um, and workers who had been unfairly treated at work. And um, so, yeah, I started and after I finished in Parliament in 2002, I came back to the unions and was more in the management side. So I um, led uh, the kind of union work of the New Zealand Nurses Organisation, which was one of the biggest unions in the country, and then eventually became the General Secretary of the um, National Distribution Union, which was actually the union I had first worked for. And oh, wow. that was an interesting, um, <laughs> an interesting thing because the, the, the then General Secretary had been in the role for 37 years, I think, and I was approached by people in the organization who wanted to see change, you know, modernization, change, new ways of organizing. And they asked me to stand against him. And it was a really nasty, horrible campaign. Um, but I won, um, which was good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of that. <laughs> and, um, and so we went about kind of reforming the union, um, mm -hmm. which like many New Zealand unions had been um, much reduced in size and power as a mm -hmm. result of a couple of decades of anti-union legislation. Um, and I won't go into the details, but basically the impact of, of those changes had been to um, really reduce the size and power of all our, almost all our unions. The public sector unions were okay um, because governments had tended to keep dealing with them, but in the private sector, um, which was where I was involved with the NDU, um, there'd been a huge attack on unionization, like you have there, you know, mm -hmm. um, anti union, union busting, basically. Yeah. And we also had our own problems. I mean, we had a uh, leadership who had grown up, had kind of learnt their trade as trade unionists at yeah. a time when they were in a very protected environment. They had good legislation and they were taken seriously and they just had to thumb the table. And, you know, that was kind of modus operandi. Um, so we went about reform, reforming the union. We um, developed a whole lot of new ways of organising. We learnt a lot from um, unions like the SEIU in the US and you know other unions around the world who were adopting a more um, aggressive campaigning style um, and using kind of new techniques for engaging workers. Um, and we started to grow. And so um, we, yeah, and, and, and there's been a lot of positive outcomes from that. Um, we also reconnected with political advocacy work because, you know, in any society, you can achieve a certain amount through bargaining, wage bargaining and collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, what has a massive impact on workers' lives is things like the minimum wage, um, minimum entitlements to holidays, sick pay, parental leave payments, all of that. Um, so we reconnected with political um, political advocacy and political organising, and, and unions have been very successful over the last 15 years or so in New Zealand at... Um, at political organising, which means, for instance, in the last few years, um, unions have won through political organising an end to zero hours contracts. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll be familiar with those. That started as a battle in the fast food industry here, but it was 
it was throughout a lot of industries. Um, and so they're now illegal, zero hours contracts. We've had massive That's increase awesome. in the minimum wage. Um, we've scrapped the youth minimum wage. So all, you know, all work did that happen? The full minimum wage. Um, some time ago now, we campaigned hard for that. I remember uh, working uh, alongside, you know, yeah. I don't know if you, yeah, I remember doing, like, doing some of that work, but I just, I didn't hear about it actually going through. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And the, um, the current government has been committed to very significant increases in the minimum wage. So mm -hmm. our current government is made up of three parties. Labour is the biggest. And Labour was started by the trade unions back in 1916. Um, wow. The Green Party and New Zealand First, which is like an old school, um, pretty racist, pretty awful bunch of geriatrics. <laughs> valid, valid, valid. <laughs> But um, has also got a sort of economic sovereignty um, and, you know, conservative, um, decent underlying set of values as well that go alongside the nasty ones. Right. right. Um, <laughs> and the three of them have agreed and been able to implement really significant minimum wage increases. Now, I think I read yesterday, actually, that New Zealand's minimum wage is the second highest in the industrialised world now, which is, you know, a lot of progress over a pretty short period of time. It just shows what you can do when you organise. I mean, a thousand percent. I was uh, chatting with somebody yet just yesterday, actually, about the, the difference in gas prices here compared to New, to New Zealand and, you know, realize that per gallon, the equivalent would be around about $7 per gallon for gas in New Zealand. So it's like, we need the minimum wage to be yeah. higher because well, we need expensive. <laughs> yeah, we need public That's transport, true, yeah. we need cycle lanes, we need walking, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, have, we have a party in opposition who's um, big, policies in this election which will be on September the 19th in New Zealand which is the anniversary of when women won the vote um, All right. um, the the main opposition party has just launched a massive policy for more roads which is pretty much the last thing the climate needs it's pretty much the worst way of getting equality and access to transport to rely on the private motor vehicle Mm, that's a little ridiculous. Mm. A little ridiculous. Um, on a brighter note, because we've only got a few minutes left, um, I have two main questions for you. One is, uh, speaking to my inner feminist here, as somebody who has done so much all at the same time, you know, you've raised children, you've been married, you've, you know, been a lawyer, you've run for office, you've done... You, you've implemented huge change, huge positive change in Aotearoa. How the truck do you do it all without going insane? Well, I have gone insane at some <laughs> moments. Okay. <laughs> Valid. Okay. My, my apologies. <laughs> so don't, don't look to me if you want some sort of, um, you know, example of, kind of unwavering <laughs> mental stability and self-confidence because I have been really low at times right. and um, I mentioned you know when the alliance kind of blew apart heartbreak literally mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in 2014 when you know uh, I had you know possibly the most difficult four months of my political life with the internet party which was you know looking back a massive error of judgment mm -hmm. on my part um, and resulted in years really of what I would, you know, and, and actually have been sort of unofficially diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as oh, a result wow. of that experience. Took me a very long time to sort of get over the feeling of shame, of brutalisation um, that came with the with the associations with the internet party. And I mean, I'm through it now and I can look back and kind of not quite laugh, but 
I can um, accept myself for having made that choice. And I always felt, you know, that it was in line with my values and it was ethical. But when people didn't see it that way, um, I remember when Hillary Clinton lost the last election and um, and I remember her saying in an interview or writing that she just had this intense feeling of shame. She didn't want to leave the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you really do internalize that as a woman. And I look at blokes who seem to be able to withstand incredible amounts of um, failure, you know, and mm -hmm. bad judgment and fuck ups and get up and do it all again as if they've got a, they're entitled to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Whereas certainly in my case, I just felt like, my God, you know, I, I'm not capable of, of doing this again. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm, but, but there are so many good things you can do, you know, and um, I, I'm actually as happy as I've ever been now with um, my work. I work for a, a trade union affiliated international development organization. So we raise money in New Zealand and support workers in the Asia Pacific region, including Fiji, where you're from. Yay, um, and you grew up in. So I wanted to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy um, i love it workers who are struggling for their rights who are trying to make better work conditions for their families and um communities to do education and skills training to raise awareness so i absolutely love that and most of my work is with young people young community activists from indonesia who um, come to new zealand and work with me and others to develop their skills and their networks to allow them to be involved in social change and environmental protection and sustainable development back in their home communities in Indonesia for the rest of their lives. So yeah. um, this kind of, at my, you know, I don't consider myself old, I'm 54, but I'm totally ready to, um, to be mainly focused on kind of nurturing, mentoring, um, facilitating uh, the generation who's going to have to save us when the shit really hits the fan. Mm, mm, mm. No, that, that's valid, valid and important work, 1000%. Um, so I guess my, my last two questions are, one, what was it like growing up in Fiji? Because you know, awesome. I, when I first found out that you grew up in Fiji, I was like, what's the truck? <laughs> That's yeah. fucking amazing. <laughs> I had no idea that, you know, that you and I had that, had that in common. Yeah. Um, and like, how is it sort of balancing living in a first world country now and have spending most, most of your life in New Zealand compared to Fiji? Um, well, I feel like I had an absolute blessed childhood because mm. most of you know those early years spent in Fiji where I was at primary school and sort of early childhood um uh well there what what do you say there's the warmth there's the um cultural generosity there's the curry um <laughs> which way better curries than you know you'll ever get in a restaurant in New Zealand um or here <laughs> Yeah, there's the time when your parents were happy together and, you know, still in love and, and mm -hmm. you know, just all those great childhood memories. And um, I really missed Fiji. So um, I never, I, I mean, for me, it's always my first time. I went there when I was three. So it's the first time I really remember. And, mm -hmm. um, and I... You know, the times I went back there later on in my teens, my 20s, to visit friends and, and family, it, you know, I'd get off that plane, you'd get that blast of humidity and you'd <laughs> think, oh, I'm home. home. And yeah. so I actually went back there a few years ago to work again. Um, 
I couldn't persuade any of my family to come with me, but I was determined to be back in Fiji. Valid. So I, um, I got a job in Suva, which is where I grew up. And I spent a couple of years working there and um, absolutely, again, you know, loved being there and felt very strongly attached to it. In the end, the mm -hmm. job um, wasn't quite what I'd expected. It was working for an international organization and I felt there are a lot of disconnects with the way, you know, being in an mm -hmm. institution like that for me personally. And I came back to New Zealand, but um, I still go back there as much as I can, unfortunately, this year. No bubble with the yeah. Pacific. Um, but yeah, I I, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated country, very small. I mean, less than a million people, but every kind of political, um, historical, economic and social and environmental challenge you can name and some amazing kind of people doing it hard on the ground. Yeah, for real, for real, for real. Thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate your time, Lila. It's so lovely to see your face again. My last question for you, if you would be so kind, is if you could give your 10 year younger self advice, what would that advice be? Mm, 10 years, don't, don't stand for parliament again. Um, it's not worth it. Um, and I don't know. God, that's really hard. I can sort of think about what I'd tell myself if I was 15, but telling myself... Uh, I'm, 15, let's have a 15 then. What would you tell you? Um, oh, look, I would just say keep doing it, you know. Keep... Let that kind of spirit drive you... Um, maybe be a bit kinder to yourself and have better boundaries for what you say yes to. Um, definitely have the kids and um, but know that they will cause you a lot of pain and anxiety and pretty much screw up your 30s for fear <laughs> of what's going to happen. Um, but it will work out and that it's an awesome thing to do. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much. For anybody who's interested in learning more about Lila or how you can get in touch with her, basically the easiest way is to Google her. Um, Lila Hara, uh, L-A-I-L-A-H-A-R-R-E -A -A -R -R -E with Mac one over it because we're fancy. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. It's really wonderful to see you. Um, and be kind to yourself and anybody who's listening again be kind be good be you know spread love like it's going out of fashion be your own kind of superhero and as I always finish off don't forget to call your mum that clearly you have potentially <laughs> uh, made very anxious and depressed and sad and horrible <laughs> have a great day guys you can